Hello, my name is Georgiana Uliaric, and I am the Frederick S. Eaton Curator of Canadian Art at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And along with Wanda Nanabush, who is Curator of Indigenous Art, we co-lead the Indigenous and Canadian Art Department. I want to let you know that I am speaking from Anishinaabe territory. This territory has been shared with the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and it's been a gathering place for Indigenous people since time immemorial. The dish with one spoon is a covenant that governs the care, the great care of the land around the Great Lakes. It is a covenant between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy. And treaties, that is to say, ways in which we work always in relation to one another, both separate and together, is really at the core of the work that we do in the Indigenous and Canadian Art Department. It gives me great pleasure today to be able to speak with the fantabulous Lakuluk Williamson Bathory. Um, I'm going to read her bio because it's impressive. Um, and then we are going to have a conversation. Lakuluk uh, lives in Iqaluit, Nunavut, performing and exhibiting works across Canada and internationally. She is a multidisciplinary Inuk artist whose practice is rooted in Walnuk mask dance um, in Kalalit, from Kalalit Nunat in Greenland, as well as acting, curating, drum dancing, music, and writing. Through her work, which is fundamentally collaborative, Williamson Bathory advocates for gender equality in creative spaces, decolonizing museum spaces, support, and supporting Indigenous political voices. She has won many awards, but most recently, the inaugural Indigenous Award of the Sinchi Foundation, which is an international organization which seeks to uphold the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. She's a frequent collaborator with renowned throat singer Tanya Tagak, performing in her Retribution music video in 2016. And in, the 2000, and in 2018, she won the inaugural Henojoak Ashavak Memorial Award from the Inuit Art Foundation, as well as the Dora Award for Outstanding New Play with Evelyn Perry, Kiyonalik, These Sharp Tools. And in 2018, almost two years to this day, we opened Tunikoshanit. Henushwak Ashavak and Timote Pitsulak, a project that was led by four inspiring Inuit curators and artists, Kumautuk Curly, Jocelyn Piranen, and Takrilik Partridge, along with Lakolok, and Anna Hudson from York University and the AGO. It was actually, um, I'd say, about um, two years yesterday from when we're taping that we had the historic seal feast where we invited the community, the Inuit community uh, from uh, Toronto and Ontario, as well as our visitors at the AGO to share with us in the celebration of this wonderful exhibition. I know Lakuluk that you are speaking from your homeland from Nuna. And I also know that your projects always begin with the land, that they are land-based. So can you speak to us? Can you talk to us about your very deep connection to Nuna? Mm. Uh, first of all, I should say that I'm very lucky to be living in Iqaluit, in Nunavut, uh, and that I have been uh, taken in as a community member here. Uh, I have a, a very multifaceted um, heritage and identity that uh, it takes a little bit to explain. So I can do that in, in processing how I have such a strong connection to Nuna. My mother is Galaluk, as you mentioned, she's uh, from Galaluk Nunat, Greenland. Uh, and I was born in Saskatoon, of all places. <laughs> Um, and my father uh, was an Englishman that spoke, spoke Inuktitut from, from Baffin Island, where I am here. So uh, I, have a, I have a foot on each side of Davis Strait. Uh, and it's um, such a joy and a difficult task. And uh, a thing that takes me much breath and, and thought to be able to to bring together all of these feelings of being an Inuk and connecting with Nuna. Uh, and the thing about being on Nuna, which means the land, uh, is that, I mean, it's, it's, I'm making a cliched uh, joke, but it grounds me. <laughs> it's 
to have such a strong connection with the land means that uh, I am working on constantly being humble because there's so much about the land that, that I don't understand or I haven't seen yet or I'm still exploring. Uh, and that my body is connected to to the the very micro organisms that that make everything possible here. I, I am of the land. I come from there. And I think that when you speak of Nuna, it isn't just a land, but it's actually the full cosmos, the air, the birds, the the stars, mm. the light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is the cosmos. Um, one of my mother's uh, favorite questions from my youngest child is, and this was a question that she was asked by, by her aunts when she was uh, a little five-year-old as well. And it means, where's the middle of your sila? And sila is a word that means the environment, the weather, the outside, and your intellect. So when it's, it's very delightful to watch um, a little child think about where the middle of this concept might be. <laughs> sometimes she points out the window, sometimes she points into the middle of her head, sometimes it's above her head. <laughs> I think it speaks to that ongoing search of how we are deeply connected and how important it is to feel deeply connected to all aspects of life and time, you know, not in, not in a linear sense at all. And we are very lucky actually at the AGO to have been able to purchase Silao Putunga which is uh, the very first work the, uh, by an Inuk that we purchased that is a moving image installation. So it is a, a great first for us. And uh, I'm, I know that you've had a long uh, standing relationship with the AGO and we hope to continue that. But speaking about uh, Sila Putunga, which again was a collaboration with Jamie Griffith and our, as well as uh, Selina Kaluk. Um, it brings together the notion of Nuna and Sila and your, uh, the corner store of your practice, which is the mask dancing. So can you, can you describe to us a little bit the piece, which we hope to install very soon <laughs> as, we, as we welcome our visitors back? Um, and in specific, what you hope to, that, that, this, uh, that this opens up for yourself, but also what it opens up for your audience as you perform and in thinking about the installation piece that is uh, uh, purposefully nonlinear, you know, it always keeps changes in terms of image and sound, um, what you hope this evokes in a visitor. And I have seen so many during Tony Khoshani that would sit down and be there for 20 minutes, half an hour, really engrossed in uh, that performance that was partly filmed in your cabin, which is very close to Ikhaluit, that you built. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, yes, Sila Purunga is a, a collaboration piece, and it is so important for me to be able to uh, create things with others. Uh, mostly because it's exciting, but also because uh, it is um, a way of distributing and contributing to uh, equal power. Um, I very much um, enjoy creating egalitarianism in very uh, various means. So I, I had the great pleasure of making Silao Putunga along with Jamie Griffiths uh, and Selina Goodluck and actually my son Iyimak as well. Uh, and he participated in, in, in it because uh, as we were packing up our our sled to go down to the cabin, uh, the kids were milling around, and uh, my husband and I looked at Ihimak and thought, he should go to school, he should come with us. <laughs> and sure enough, for the next three, four days on the land with no power, um, it was minus 20, uh, with no running water, frozen ice melting on our oil stove. Um, Jamie, my son and I made, made this film. Uh, and then when we came back uh, and put all the imagery together into uh, what we wanted to make, uh, Selena, Selena and I made, made the soundscape for it. 
So the words uh, themselves, silau putunga, means the whole in sila, that concept that encapsulate the universe, the environment, the outside, the intellect. Um, so it's like it's like a porthole into the universe. Uh, and what we wanted to uh, create was um, a, a study of intimacy within a great expanse. Like the thought of how small the cabin is uh, compared to the city of the Khaloin, uh, or how tiny of uh, a human being I am within the vastness of the ice. Uh, and the ability to turn from a human into a semi-human or supernatural or unnatural creature that uh, is um, being able to rip through these realms, like piercing through something, piercing through an eyeball, piercing through the air, uh, piercing into the ice. Uh, and what we did in the end was uh, we really wanted to be able to um, give thanks uh, to Kinuaiwa Ashivag and Timuji Pitulak for uh, encouraging us to expand our imagination with their work. And we created this uh, we created this installation that is see through. Well, it's not really see through. You can walk around it, and you can watch the film on either side of it and it glows uh, and you hear the sound from all around and as the the imagery and the story spills out on this screen that is um, emitting from both sides uh, you hear the soundtrack differently each time basically the concept is that the, the film is 20 something minutes long and the soundtrack is uh, 12 to 14 minutes along and I love that because if you sit with the imagery long enough you can feel so many dif different emotions by listening to the soundtrack because each emotion that comes out of the, the sound hits the imagery in a different way so you can feel differently about each thing that you see if you sit there long enough. Well I know that's very different for you because when you perform you actually have um, that very powerful, intimate relationship with the audience as you move through the audience in um, your performances, our live performances, um, and you really want to break down barriers, you know, through, through humor, uh, sexuality, uh, lots of sexiness. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering how you think about that differently when it's a work um, that kind of stands on its own and you in your own body is not present there to engage directly um, and and uh, and how you hope that in fact through the installation which is critical that surround sound the way that the images kind of bleed into one another or hopefully will one day bleed into one another from both sides um, that uh, that, that it's a different kind of connection between you and the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing can replace um, live performance. Um, the thing that blows me away about live performance is that uh, people in the audience um, begin to develop the same heartbeat because they're breathing at the same time and they're looking at things at the same time. And so we have this very visceral connection with one another uh, that can't be replicated uh, at any other time. It's, it's a spiritual moment to be able to be there with everyone right then and there. Um, and I think Silao Putunga is actually something that, uh, that taught me so much about uh, what is to come now uh, within, within the context of the pandemic. Uh, we, can, we can't, we can't have that intimacy uh, for the foreseeable future, for the safety of our elders and, and the generations to come. And I'm very willing to, to continue being safe like this because of looking after the elders and youth. Um, but uh, what I love 
uh, is that uh, we've been able to create um, something that is off kilter. Um, and, and that's one of the, the um, big purposes, one of the main purposes of Uayon is to, to send both the performer and the audience off on a path that was not expected so that you are able to um, in, take a step, step back from what you understand and go at it from another route. Um, I'm very happy that we were able to accomplish at least that sense of being off kilter within Sila Putunga. And it's fascinating what you said about uh, uh, we would not have thought that that, that work and that shift in your work um, would take new nuance or new context uh, in this moment where the world uh, is in lockdown, as it were. And um, I think uh, Nunavut might be one of the few places left on earth uh, that does not yet have any confirmed cases uh, of COVID-19. In fact, uh, it's made world news, <laughs> the fact that uh, mm -hmm. there have been no confirmed, but that does not mean that this pandemic um, has not impacted the community. And so I wondered if you could speak a little bit about the last few months uh, and the impact on you, your practice. I know that you're very hard at work on many, many projects, 16 hour days <laughs> you continue to have. Uh, so speak a bit about um, what you feel the impact has been um, on the Halwit community and, and if you like more specifically on you and your, and your practice and your family. Mm. So the biggest change for us is that um, only Nunavut residents or essential workers are allowed to be in Nunavut now, are allowed to travel to Nunavut. Um, and before Nunavut residents or essential workers can come uh, they have to spend two weeks in a specified quarantine hub in the south. Um, so there's a there's this time barrier between um, within the the realm of being able to travel to Nunavut, which makes um, everybody stay at home. Really, there's a uh, medical travel, uh, and there's essential travel, and and the rest of us, uh, for better or worse, uh, stay home. I know that there's a friend of mine has not been able to see her daughter who um, needs special care in the south and they haven't seen each other for six months which is totally heartbreaking and um, my oh <laughs> just thinking about that makes my heart ache and the small sacrifices like in my own family um, I won't see my mother for quite some time as well but um my goodness, <laughs> I didn't think talking out loud about mothers and daughters being separated would, would um, catch me off guard so, so much. I think there's so but, much so, Go ahead. So it's, it's in, in one hand, it is, uh, I'm so full of gratitude to be able to stay in this beautiful, safe realm. Um, but it is um it is at at the um expense of of very intimate relationships that's for sure i think that it has uh, surprised people you know and uh the the you know the 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 the, the deep uh, need that we have for human touch for human connection for connecting with a family of loved ones, and even things like chance encounters, you know, that you happen to turn a corner and see someone, or, um, you know, ev everything is so planned in a way now, you know, where we have to uh, program how we interact socially, um, that fundamentally changes sort of the, the, the spirit of, of humanity in a way, and it's, uh, mm. it's very painful. In a way, it is, but I think that um, I think this is an opportunity for all of us to uh, reinvent intimacy uh, and humanity without the very fragile uh, systems that have been that have been upheld by colonization, patriarchy, and capitalism. Well, 
We live uh, in very powerful times right now, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, when people speak of reckoning that is coming, long time coming, uh, that it really will be sustained. And it feels like um, maybe more people are listening or more people are willing to engage in this conversation, but I know that uh, you, along with many other uh, very powerful Inuit voices, have been engaged in speaking to these ongoing systemic issues that really have been there uh, from the very beginning, um, ongoing daily reports and sometimes not reports on ongoing injustice at the state authority, at the hands of state authority, um, how we can all find uh, ways to actually sustain some meaningful change so that we can have a more uh, equitable and justice justice world, but it affects all aspects of life, um, especially for Indigenous and Inuit communities, and I know you've been involved for a long time. Um, can you talk about your thoughts in this moment, right, where we're separated but still together and this ongoing pandemic of violence, not just um, the virus? Mm -hmm. um, what I keep hearing from uh, from my family, from my community, and from the people that teach me about uh, the the true impact of racism is that uh, we have been waiting. Um, and I watched a, a documentary yesterday about uh, Stonewall, and that was in 1969. And there were uh, black queer people saying in the footage, we have been waiting. And I think about what happened with the decolonization of uh, Greenland and the imagery that was used in the 1950s to the 1970s was of Inuit uh, trying to find both retribution and uh, emancipation with the Vikings and the same thing we have been waiting so there is so much momentum and so much hope to be able to destroy these systems of, of racism and colonization patriarchy and the byproduct uh, of capitalism um, and I hope with all my heart that with with our actions and with our art and, and words and connection that we can dismantle the system that is killing innocent people for centuries. And really move towards uh, sovereignty and agency and and uh, uh, I think uh, I am I am always uh, I guess maybe naively surprised at the resistance and the defensiveness that continues to exist. You know, the, the other day, even in parliament, so you have this mm -hmm. state system and in parliament, someone speaks their mind very powerfully, say, speaking to the issues at hand. Uh, but the way that the structure works, um, it was Jagmeet Singh who gets kicked out of parliament for, for speaking uh, a reality that for him it is lived and for many other ones is lived. So it's, it's so insidious in so in small ways in big ways in every way mm -hmm. um, and how is it that is it possible for these structures that have been in place for over uh, 500 years to to shift to change to a model of sovereignty you know I think this is what we're mm -hmm. we're grappling with and and hoping to find a path for for mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing is, though, um, it shouldn't be seen as surprising no, that no. Jack Singh was taken out of Parliament for naming a racist as as racist as this person was, um, because as you just said, you see it in in the grand gestures like taking the the, the first non-white leader of Parliament out of the place that he is showing representation in, to the very intimate um, interactions in, in small organizations. Um, I was just thinking today about how um, for the longest time in anti-racist rhetoric, uh, people have been talking about what uh, they call microaggressions. 
you know the the little the little things that build up to to cause a person who's black indigenous or a person of color uh, to get angry and I keep thinking that word microaggression just minimizes it, it even that much more. They're just plain old aggressions, you know? Uh, and it's no wonder people have so much anger. You're not supposed to bottle that up. That is, that is oppression. That is killing people and killing people's souls. Um, yeah, so one of the, I mean, to bring it back to how my family is dealing with, with the many pandemics um, that this moment is, um, the, the chief medical officer uh, of public health here said at the very beginning of it, think of this as a blizzard. You have to uh, batten down the hatches, stay inside, uh, and be calm until the blizzard passes. And that was, uh, that was a, a, a moment of instant recognition for everybody here in Nunavut, because we do get these huge storms uh, where you know, the power gets cut off, everybody goes home and uh, eats chips <laughs> until the storm passes. So, so my family and I, were, we, we know how to do that. Um, we know how to do that for you know, time immemorial, the storm comes and we have to be safe uh, but um, the other thing is that in terms of like how my family is talking about uh, about this revolutionary moment to deal with with racism is that there's both the the, um, the willingness to speak to to children uh, alike uh, along with adults at the same time as adults uh, truly and uh, in plain language so that they can take these concepts and, and absorb them. Um, so my children and I have very honest um, discussions about who, what they are seeing and what they are feeling. And uh, we try and find all sorts of reference points uh, from around the world for them to be able to re relate to. And so, that's how my family is dealing with it and how that translates into what I do as an art practice is that um, yeah th that's my grounding is being able to communicate with my family and have those conversations and be a part of the land having them at our cabin uh, and then seeing this as an individual expression uh, that's something that uh, the colonial systems for Inuit has uh, has never encouraged. We're not to, supposed to see ourselves as people with individual expression. We're supposed to be in this more homogenized, um, uh, behaving, calm, smiley people who take what they're given. Uh, and I want to be able to burst that stereotype by saying each one of us has our own sexuality our own way of putting words together, our own uh, way of seeing the world. And the more we communicate this individuality together, the more we actually strengthen each other. Uh, the more we actually do become a collective with strong political, emotional thought. I think that this uh, notion of intergeneration, right? The way you speak that um, you know your, the children are the are the teachers of the parents, and um, the way in which uh, when we worked on the project, you were so inspiring to me. The way you spoke of Hanuju uh, Akashvak and Timothy Pitsulak, and that that kind of you know um, as the gift, you know, and uh, the the team having selected this title that spoke as a gift that was given, and that this gift is also a responsibility and how do we move it, move it forward. Um, it is always so inspiring to speak with you um, and, and hear of ways that we can actually sustain multiple ways in, multiple ways of thought uh, and centering um, Inuit voice or indigenous voice and how important that is in fact um, for all of us to be able to to live in a much uh, much more beautiful world really 
So I wonder, Lakuluk, if uh, you will show us a little bit, open the, the canvas tent a little bit oh. so we can see the beautiful <laughs> yeah. land. <laughs> My yeah. kids put this tent up um, <gasps> about a week ago themselves. <laughs> they put these wooden posts up and were lost inside the canvas for quite some time, but they opened, they built it perfectly. I don't know if it's blanked out, but you can see the sea ice beyond the, the rooftops there. Yes, it's coming into focus and uh, also the rooftops, yes, and the sea ice, absolutely. And just the, the, <laughs> the green of the Nuna, we can see up close in the rocks. Mm -hmm. It's just starting to green now. Um, and there's big, big bumblebees about this size <laughs> flying around, pollinating all the plants. And there's uh, still people going out onto the ice to seal hunt right now and catch geese and bring eggs home. But it's very wet. Uh, mm -hmm. And all of us are um, actually starting to uh, get ready to uh, prepare our boats for when the ice breaks up and we can start a whole new season. In my garden I am very lucky. Uh, I'm very lucky to have butterflies and the other day I saw a hummingbird eating from the chestnut tree flower. It was a it was a beautiful gift. I had never seen a hummingbird in my yard ever before so I thought it was a, a beautiful omen. That's so I wanna, lovely. I saw a butterfly on the screen earlier, actually. Oh, did you? Oh, good. <laughs> um, I want to thank you very much. And um, I want to let everyone know that we are going to end with a beautiful recording of your poem, I Am the Light of Happiness, that you wrote for Henry Wack upon her passing. And um, again, thank you very much personally and in every way for speaking with me today and always being such a wonderful inspiration. Mm, all my love, thank you. Thank you to you and your family. I can smell the air around the camp where Kinnuayu Ashivak was born. The air is fresh upwind, cooling the tip of your nose and tasting of a wild dash from the water. Downwind, you can smell the dogs, the burning seal oil, and wort skins. It is not a bad smell. It is the smell of home. I can see Kinnuayuak as a small child, her dimpled brown hands waving at the sky, and her fat feet digging into the curves of her mother's back. A tangle of hair at the back of her toddler's head turns sharply as she takes in the vision of an upik for the first time in her young life. That was all that time ago when people still crossed the Atlantic by ship and hardly anyone owned cars. I can see the swirls of snow around the Ithluyak where Kinnuayuak first started sewing, her young hands steadfastly holding on to her needle and thread, her eyes darting over to the work of her older women folk. Outside, the glow of light and warmth is beckoning within the sparkly darkness. It is an aquamarine hue of home. That was all that time ago, when there was barely a railroad, let alone highways. As colors and animals and sewing and words filled Kinnuayuak's vision, she was also witness to the clash of shamanism and Christianity in the Arctic. It took her father away. That was all that time ago when the clash of dogmatism took many fathers away during the Second World War. 
It would be dangerous to say that Kinuayuak's life was idyllic. Idyllic because she lived on the land until she was in her 30s, already long married and the mother of many children. She emerged and re-emerged from death and sickness many times, and that is no different from what we endure today. But it is safe to say that Kinnu Ayuak's life was resilient. She used art to heal, to express, and to love the world around her. In her own words, there is no word for art. We say it is to transfer something from the real to the unreal. I am an owl. And I am a happy owl. I like to make people happy and everything happy. I am the light of happiness. And I am a dancing owl. There is a myth that Inuit did not have a concept of art before the modern age. That there is no three-letter word for it. No full-time profession devoted to the creation of it. That the introduction of paper transformed everything. Allow me to defy the notion by saying this. There is no such thing as Canadian art before Kinuayuak. Canada is hand-drawn by Kinuayuak. The lines that swooped in and rushed out at the same time, the bulbs of power, the circles of light, the kimilnak red, sungak yellow, dungu purple, outline and color our modern identity. Her deft fingers created images that were catalysts. You see, before Pierre Trudeau and his dancing feet, there was no Canadian unity, just Canadian confusion. This country as we know it was still basically a British colony with no nationalism of its own. It was a place that smacked of imperialism, residential schools, and assimilation. In those 1960s days, we got the Canada flag, 100 years of existence, French immersion schools, the Montreal Metro and its rounded bucket seats, the National Arts Centre and its octagons, and Expo 67, and the Enchanted Owl and Inuit art. It was an explosion of Canadian celebration, a blooming of Canadian togetherness. A time when people were allowed to express their love for land and modern aesthetics. Kinuayuak and her owls and birds burst into the international scene when Canadians needed someone from the land with indigeneity to give a non-verbal Canadian identity. Not only did she give us this identity, she gave us a whole new world to gaze upon. Little did the art world care to realize that they were creating the myth that Inuit did not make art before it was marketed to the South. Here was a genius who never admitted to seeing her own artistry. Here was an artist who thrived on collaboration here was a woman devoted to her family, her loves. Here was an Inuk who traveled the world only speaking Inuktitut. From the outside looking in, many people saw a traditional person entering the modern world because they could not understand her modesty, her methods, nor her words. But from the inside out, we know that her modesty made her soul rich, that her community believed in her. We know that she helped create modernity. 
And it is our job now to make sure that our art, our words, are always challenging us to change the world. Aren't we so lucky that we can still look at all the light of happiness that she gave us and still be able to ask her dancing forms? Kanu wok kinuayuak. Kanu wok.